Welcome to the episode of Jay Leno's Garage. Tonight we're going to talk about my favorite kind of car, original and unrestored. This is a 1918 Cadillac, a Type 57. And by original unrestored, I mean original paint. The engine has not been opened up. Original interior. Everything on this car is just as it was in 1918. One or two minor things, and I'll show you those in a minute. This car looks this way because it's never been out of Southern California. It's always been a Southern California car. And it's always been a protected car. The gentleman I got it from, John Woodward, he was a wonderful uh, custodian for this car. He had it for years and years. And even back in the 50s, this car was uh, something special. People just knew to take care of it. It always been garaged. And it shows you a car can last almost 100 years with uh, Pretty minimal care, too, as long as you don't abuse it. Uh, it is amazing that this is the original paint, the original wood wheels. What we put on these wood wheels is something called linseed oil. You put it on with a brush, and uh, it feels a little sticky, because uh, I did it last week. Uh, and it makes the wood expand, and it tightens up the wheel. You know, in the old days, uh, they, used to, they used to tell you to park your car in a low creek so the water would get into the wood spokes and swell them up so they wouldn't clank when you drive. Or you can just put linseed oil on them. Now, one thing you want to be careful of, if you do have a car with wooden wheels and you put linseed oil on, take the rags, throw them outside, because linseed oil is very combustible. If you take a linseed oil rag and you throw it in the trash, it could combust like that. So that's a, a fairly common thing. But let's move on. Uh, the only thing that's different in this car Somewhere on the long line, somebody chose to get artistic and put this green uh, element in the headlights. But other than that, everything is exactly as it should be. Uh, this is a Victoria model. I think this is one of the prettiest cars. The interesting thing is these posts come out. You see the screws up in here? You unscrew those, and you can make it a full open car. But I like it just the way it is. And this has something called the Fat Man Wheel. That's what they called it, the fat man wheel. It was for men of girth, successful men, men of business. Yes, yes, if you had a big gut, well, that meant you were successful in 1918. And what you do is you'd pinch these two right here, and then you see the wheel would fall away like that. You get in, you sit down, and you pull the wheel up, and there you are. I'm somewhat a man of girth, but to be really successful, you need that, that big gut, apparently. But uh, this is the kind of car you drive around and collect the rent in, you know? This was not an inexpensive car. This car was about $4,000 in 1918. And this is the car that really made Cadillac. This was the first modern mass-produced V8. Now, V8s have been produced since, what, 1903? Didion did the first V8. The French made V8s Cunningham, which we did a couple of months ago here on the website. You saw that. Cunningham V8, but those were limited production, no more than 100 cars, maybe 200 cars a year, and they cost about $9,000. This was the first true mass-produced V8, and this is the car that really made Cadillac, in my opinion. Uh, I mean, Cadillac was started by a gentleman named uh, Henry Leland, who was one of my heroes. Henry Leland was born in 1843. He ran a company called Leland and Falconer. Uh, he was the man who really pushed precision machining in the United States. Uh, Colt and a no number of other uh, gun manufacturers did precision uh, manufacturing, but uh, Henry Leland uh, took it to a new level. In fact, uh, Cadillac, which was originally the Ford Motor Company, if you don't know this, one of Ford's, I think Ford's first or second company, uh, he got into an argument with the uh, essentially the board of directors. Ford wanted to make an inexpensive car, they wanted to build an expensive car. Henry Lee and those guys bought Ford out, changed the name to Cadillac, and built the Cadillac automobile. Uh, Cadillac got really famous in 1908 when it went to England and it won what they call the Dewar's Trophy. Now, in England, they did not believe in interchangeable parts, so they, it, everything was sort of handmade. And Henry Leland believed that uh, all cars should have interchangeable parts. He learned that during the Civil War when they were manufacturing guns. 
that if a piece of a gun broke, you could take another gun off the battlefield, slip it in, and replace it. Uh, so what he did in 1908, they brought six Cadillacs, I believe it was, to England. Uh, they went into a building. They disassembled all six cars, threw all the parts in a box, and dumped them out on the floor. And the English said, go ahead, put them back together, let's see. Well, they put all six back together. They started on the first crank, and they went on to win the, uh, I think, some sort of endurance race, thus getting the, uh, the Dewar's Trophy. And it really made, uh, in the eyes of the British and the Europeans, appreciate American manufacturing because interchangeable parts was not something that they, uh, that they did. Um, let's take a look at the engine of this thing. It is a beautifully manufactured V8. As you can see, it looks a little rough because it has not been restored. It has detachable heads, three main bearings, two water pumps, which is kind of interesting. You know, most cars of this period had what they call thermosiphoning, like uh, the Model T. Uh, the water got hot and it kind of rose and kind of pushed itself through and circulated and was not an efficient way to cool. This had not one water pump, as I said, but two. And uh, even has a compressor at the end of the transmission here, right under the car. I'll show you that in a minute. If you get a flat tire, you shut off the car, you, dis you engage the compressor, you start up the compressor pumps, and you pump up all four of your tires. Pretty interesting. Little oil can here. The fun thing about these cars like this is everything is your fault. You know, nowadays, people sue, but I just like stuff like this. Driving an automobile does not mean, simply mean starting, steering, and stopping. We believe that we are safe in saying that 95% that, uh, of all, all so-called troubles are directly traceable to you. It's your fault. You did something wrong. Abuse, carelessness, lack of understanding. You don't understand how the car works. Study this manual. I mean, it's fantastic. And, you know, owning an automobile was a huge deal back in 1918 because there was a lot of stuff you had to do. See, here you go. As the owner, here's what you should do on a monthly basis. Just, uh, just do this little lubrication thing here. No, no problem. You see that? Just hit all those points. Once a month, you'll be fine. Look at this, every 125 miles. Here's stuff you have to do every 125 miles. You, you had to be a real enthusiast to own a car in those days. You know what else is pretty neat? Compartment behind the seat, and I found this. Eat and drink comfortably in your car. Look at that, fantastic. Look, it it's assembles in five seconds. Five seconds, look at that. So you sit down, you have a sandwich, you got hot coffee, you got the whole deal right there. A new convenience for picnics and outings. Eat and drink comfortably in your car. Fantastic. This is a car that I don't think has ever been abused, and everything meshes nicely. Everything, all the gears slide together nicely. I mean, I change the lubricants pretty often, and I flush the system. It did sit for a little while, but here's something kind of cool. You want to see how you, uh, how you dim the headlights? See this linkage here? This linkage connects up to you right by your steering wheel. So you that's your dimmer switch there, and you can hear it go clunk, clunk. But I don't believe the heads have ever been off this engine. Uh, we've done a few things. We repaired the horn, found the original horn, put that back on. I've kept the engine as it was, with the original kind of peeling porcelain and it's just a nice old girl to drive. You got your primer cups here. Put a little, in the cold weather, you'd put a little raw fuel in there and you'd, that would help you get it started. You know, my dad used to say, the Cadillac, that's the Rolls Royce of automobiles. <laughs> I go, dad, uh, he, he, he would always say that. I don't know why, he didn't quite get it, but uh, that's what he would say. Uh, but, but you understand why it's a Rolls Royce of automobiles when you drive it. It is so smooth and so nice to drive. You know, I use this as an everyday car. It's not a freeway car. Top speed in this car is probably 65, but you don't want to push it that. It's, when this car was built, the speed limit was 35 miles an hour. So when you drive it at 45 to 50, God, it's, it's really nice. It's comfortable. It's got a jump seat in it here. Let me show you the other side of the motor. It has almost 100 years of use in this car. And all the nickel and chrome, well, there was no chrome in 1918. The, the nickel has obviously faded from years of people grabbing this door and opening the door. 
and your window's turned this way. Look at this. See, these go up, and then your window goes up in there like that. And as I mentioned, that section comes out, and those fold back down there. Then you have this jump seat right here. This is my favorite part of this thing. Your passenger would sit behind you, and if you need to take an extra passenger, this jump seat folds up like that, and they would sit right there. The clock works. Well, the clock didn't work when we first got it. We, but you know, again, beautiful mechanical clock. When you buy a modern car nowadays, it might say a famous clockmaker's name on the face, but it's usually just some cheap electric clock that runs off the battery. This, these are beautiful hand-wound, I think, are they Waltham? Waltham clocks? Yeah, I mean, these are just beautiful pieces of, beautiful time pieces, and you wind them, and you get a nice kind of ticking. It's one of the things you get it or you don't. You know, the difference between this and a Model T, it, it's really amazing. As, as much fun as my Model T is, this thing is smooth and just has so much torque. It's 70 horsepower at 2,400 RPM. As I said, it's three main bearings. You've got your dome light. You've got uh, your windshield opens up here. Uh, you've got your optional visor. Let me show you how you start this thing. Uh, this is your fuel pump. You pump up your fuel like that. Turn the key. Hit the starter button. And we are ready to go motoring. It's hard to convey just what a nice driving automobile this is. There's nothing like original. Everything just sort of is lapped in and all the parts seem to work together very nicely. Steering is not heavy. Brakes are not the greatest, but hey. 50 miles an hour is a nice speed for this thing. The nice thing is with this high roof, if you see Lincoln hitchhiking, he can keep his hat on if you give him a ride. I know it sounds kind of silly to say, but this was sort of like the Cadillac CTS-V of the day. A V8, 70 horsepower. This was a high performance car. As I mentioned, these posts come out if you unscrew these two bolts, and uh, these two wing nuts, rather, and you can make it more open car. But I, I, I like leaving them here. I like the center post. The thing that amazes you about this car is how smooth it is, how nice it is to drive. Uh, again, most cars were four cylinders, maybe six cylinders, although uh, Packard did come out with their twin six 12 about the same time as this. That was another higher level. This, as I said, the first mass-produced V8 that was successful. And uh, what a great engine it is. We'll go over the controls. This, I said, is your steering wheel that it moves out of the way like that. This is a hand throttle. And this is, a, uh, this is your advance and retard on your ignition. Uh, this is your ignition switch here. Headlights. This turns on your interior lights. Uh, you've got your uh, fuel tank pressure, oil pressure, oil pressure rather, ammeter. That's your speedometer there and your clock. This is your hand pump to you pump up your fuel once. Once that's pumped up, there's a little mechanical pump that'll keep it pumped. You got a jump seat right here. This folds forward just like that to take another person and see, kind of goes up like that. And then you got your uh, gas pedal down there and your starter pedal right over there. Now way out in front of me, you can see your motor meter, so you can see how hard or cool the engine is running. That's your temperature gauge, essentially. Shifts very nicely. Very torquey motor. It says 35,000 miles. I'm guessing it's more like 135,000. 
clock works, that's got the right time. The fun thing about living in California is no matter what kind of vehicle you're looking for, it's probably within 50 miles of LA. I don't care if you're talking Ferraris or Vincent motorcycles, this is where the car culture really came, especially in the 30s and 40s. Hot rodding started here, all kinds of interesting vehicles hidden away in a lot of these garages. I like any old car you can drive in modern traffic, you know. Stuff from the late 1800s, the early 03, 04, 05, those are a little tricky because a little spindly, but this, this is a real automobile. You can drive this as you would a modern car. You know, there are cars like the McLaren F1 and those kind of cars where you just go out and tear around and have fun. Then there are cars that are just pleasurable to drive. And I, it's hard for me to relate how pleasurable this car is to drive. Everything is just moves so nicely. You just feel the mechanicalness of it. It's really a pleasure. Original understore, that's really the way to go. Well, I hope you enjoyed this trip down memory lane, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye.